Influencers, they're ruling our world today. What is an influencer? If you're, if you're older than, than me, uh, influencers were, was something kind of new to me a few months ago. I, I kind of figured it out when my 14-year-old nephew told me his goal in life was to be a social media influencer. That was kind of the first time it tweets. It's like, oh, okay, that's a thing. And some kids think that's going to be a job one day and everything. But an influencer is a person who inspires or guides the actions of others. As you can clearly see from the things that uh, 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 Janelle shared with us there or Lee shared with us there. I was thinking historically, though, before we had social media influencers, there are influential people all throughout history. And I did a quick search and found the 100 most influential people of all time. And here they are. Uh, Well, the top 10 plus one at the bottom. We have Muhammad was number one. And then Isaac Newton, then Jesus, we all know Jesus. Then there was Buddha, Confucius, Paul, he's the guy that wrote most of the New Testament. Uh, And then this guy, Sai Lun, who knows what he did? Free coffee for anybody that knows. Oh, he invented paper, okay? So, which really helped Gutenberg because without paper, it wouldn't have mattered what Gutenberg did. Then, of course, Columbus. And, and then if you add number 15 in, we got Moses. Three of the top 15 were people from our scriptures. And these are historical characters. And I, I was fascinated that if we add in other religious leaders, we, of course, have Muhammad and Buddha there, all in that top 10. Now, this is a very subjective list, depending on the maker of the list, as you would understand. You're probably already looking at this list and thinking, where is this person, that person, the other person, right? Well, what that proves to us and what that points out to us is something very simple. Influence is something that is granted by those being influenced, okay? An influencer can't influence unless we let them influence, right? Does that make sense? Sure, sure. So, If we fast forward to today, those were from centuries ago. If we fast forward today, the top 10 social media influencers today. Didn't even know this first one, and he's a sports guy, Cristiano Ronaldo. Anybody know of him? Right? Whoa, okay, okay. Anybody follow him on social media? And you're willing to admit it? Okay, I saw a hand. I see that hand. Praise God. All right. Justin, anybody follow Justin Bieber on social media? And willing to admit it? Oh, there's there's some... (laughs) Was that, I, I, I heard a cheer over here and a groan over here. What about you guys online? You, you guys, uh, you're probably looking at some of these people while you're watching the service. Welcome, by the way. Glad that you are here. And we go on down the list, and we see all these people who are influencing us today. I did a quick check on Friday to see where Lee at Love Lee was on this uh, 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 scale, and she had 17 influencers on Friday when I first did this. Simon found out she actually has 18 now, all right? So, is Janelle here? Wave at me, no? Okay. Janelle, you're online probably. You got a ways to go, okay, <laughs> to catch up with Kim Kardashian and the others. But hey, who knows? By the end of this series, you're all gonna start following her and then uh, and, and spread that and she's gonna go viral. Now, I said earlier that My 14-year-old nephew said he wanted to be an influencer. I think he's starting too late. Look at this. We saw this in the store uh, the other day, or Simon actually sent it to me. There is a vlogger set for three-year-old plus, right? Okay. Start your Christmas shopping early. You get your kids started early. They can be an influencer maybe someday if you're into that sort of thing. So when we look at that list of influencers today, I think it should give us at least a bit of pause when we consider what an influencer is. If you go back to that definition of an influencer, it's a person who inspires or guides the actions of others. Influencers make the rules that we live by without even telling us they're making the rules. Just by the things they do, the things they promote, the things that they follow, when we follow them, we're following their rules. Rules. Now, what's a rule? A rule is an accepted principle that tells you what you are allowed or not allowed to do. Now, here in Victoria, if you're online, we live in the state of Victoria in uh, Melbourne, and we know about rules, don't we? 
Yeah, the last two years, it's just been crazy, the rules. And those are rules for everyone. But not all rules are for everyone. I have two books here. And these two books are about gridiron, officiating. Some of you may know I love gridiron, and in spare time when it's happening, I actually officiate gridiron games. Well, to officiate a gridiron game, I need to know all these rules and lots of fine print, and then I need to know all these. These are rules about the rules kind of thing. And you think that's funny. Well, we do that too. We'll get there in just a minute. But there are rules about the rules. But for the gridiron rules, they don't apply to anyone in this building unless you're playing gridiron in Australia. Okay, the gridiron players submit themselves to the makers of those rules, right? They choose to do that if they're going to play gridiron. Similarly, influencers are able to make rules, but the only people that have to live by those rules are the people that choose to allow those influencers to influence them. Are you tracking with me? All right, I know this is a whole lot of setup to get to the Ten Commandments. We're, we're actually going to get there, I promise you, in a few weeks. <laughs> Who are the greatest influencers in your life? Maybe your parents. Maybe it's your teachers. Maybe it's off the list that we had there a while ago. Is it a musician, a sports star, a social media influencer, a pastor? Yeah, probably not. Today, we're starting a series called Rules to Live By. And in this series, that we're basing the series on a collection of ancient writings from the book of Exodus in the Bible. And chapter 20 is where we're going to spend the whole series. We're going to be looking at some rules to live by from there. We have all heard of the Ten Commandments. Anyone in the room never heard of the Ten Commandments? Okay, if you raise your hand, I was going to say, Janelle just told you about them a few minutes ago. We have a list of commandments, and even people who are not church people have heard of them. And for some, it's actually turned them off of church, because when they hear about the commandments and the rules, they immediately assume that's what Christianity is all about, that's what church is all about, it's all about rules, it's all about living by a list and all this stuff, and I don't want any part of that. Part of that. Anybody here like that, or you've been like that, or you left church for years and came back because of those things. From the original 10, there was actually 613. 613 commands in the Old Testament. There were rules about how to live our life, and they were rules that defined the rules. So rules about the rules. There's much debate over the commandments today. Are they for us today? Are we required to keep them? Are we a better person or a better Christian, if you're a Christian, if you're able to keep the commandments? Those are kind of questions that, that roll around with people today. And I'm going to give you a spoiler that will come out through the series. Here's the spoiler. God knew when he gave the commandments that human beings, fallen, broken, messed up human beings like you and like you and like you and you and you and me would not be able to keep the commandments. Okay? That's what the whole Jesus thing is all about. That's why Jesus needed to come and die and raise again, okay? So that sets this whole thing up for you to understand that we can't keep the commandments, and God knew that. So then the question is, what are the commandments all about? What are they there for? Well, the Apostle Paul, writing to uh, believers in Rome, said this. He says, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. The law, the commandments, are there to show us that we can't keep them, to show us that we fall short of what God's perfect standard is. So when we look at the commandments, we need to understand they're there to reveal our sinfulness so that we can understand that we're sinners. Over the next eight weeks, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments, and we're going to wrestle with their relevance for today. A little more background. Of the ten, four of them deal with our relationship with God. Six of them deal with our relationship with each other. God knew that would be even harder, so he had to have a couple of extra commands there. The nine of the ten are restated as commands in the New Testament. You'll figure out which one was not as we go through the series. 
The New Testament makes it very clear that we are not under the law. In fact, in Romans 7, it says that we died to the law in Christ and that we were set free from it. And then in Galatians, Paul writing to another church says, you need to be careful not to slip back into trying to keep the commandments. You need to live in grace, not the law. However, being free from the law does not mean being free to sin. Liberty is not a license. Now with all that as a backdrop, today I want us to look at this question. When it comes to life in general, who gets to make the rules? We've seen this whole list of influencers and everything. We've talked a lot about that. But really, for your life, who gets to make the rules? Is it Jordan Peterson, 12 Rules for Life? Is it Lee at Love Lee? Well, 18 of you might be thinking that that She's got some value there. To answer this question about who gets to make the rules, we need to go all the way back to the start. All the way back to start in Genesis chapter one where it says this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created human beings. I would suggest to you today that God gets to make the rules because he created us. Okay, it's that simple. God created us. He gets to make the rules. See, if I make something, I get to decide what that something is and what that something does, and it doesn't have any ability or power or authority over me, right? I tried that with my kids for years. In fact, I would tell them, I brought you into the world. I can take you out. But that was actually a lie, by the way, for my kids that are here, uh, because God brought you into the world, not me. But anyway, Now, this illustration falls down a little bit because other than my kids, I've never made anything in my life. But a dear friend of mine and our church council chairperson, Matt Wilson, made something for me and gave it to me, so it's mine now, okay? So it can be like I made it. We'll we'll just go there, okay? He he gave me this owl that he he made himself and everything. By the way, you can probably start buying these if he wants to uh, set up a shop. But anyway, uh, because I was going through a a difficult time and he wanted to remind me that I needed wisdom, right? And uh, so he put that on my desk and I look at it all the time and uh, ask God for wisdom. Now, this morning when I brought this owl over, this wood carving of an owl, it's not an idol, by the way, we'll talk about idols next week, Pastor Deanna. (laughs) When I brought it over this morning, we didn't have a discussion about it, me and the owl. The owl had no input. The owl didn't argue with me or debate or say, I don't want to go to church today. It just came with me, right? Okay, now in a much, 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 much more complex way on a much more complicated scale, this is our relationship with God. He created us. And he gets to call all the shots. He really does because we are his. A couple of verses that show us that. In Psalm chapter 100, it says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. Full stop. Then in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it says this, There is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. He created So we live for him. And then one more. I love this verse in Jeremiah chapter 18. O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. God is the creator, so he gets to make the rules. Does it make sense? Right, right. Now, if that wasn't enough, God gets to make the rules because he's the creator, but there's more, all right? Hang on here. If we look into Exodus chapter 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are, and we're gonna be going through those. Exodus chapter 20, verse one and two says, then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. So before giving them the Ten Commandments, He told them two things. He says, I am the Lord your God. So he talked about his positional relationship with them. Then he talked about what he had done. I rescued you from slavery. 
So, not only does God get to make the rules because he's creator, but God gets to make the rules because he cares for us. Did you see that? God cares for us, so he gets to make the rules. He had positional authority because of who he was. He has practical authority because of what he had done. He rescued them because he loved them. They've been in slavery for over 400 years, but during that time, God never forgot them. And when he decided to rescue them, he told Moses, I've heard their cries, I've seen their suffering, and I want to deliver them. And I'm gonna use you to do it. That's why Moses is here in the story. Exodus chapter 19, if we go back one chapter, right before he's setting up to uh, uh, give the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19 and verse four, it says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Amen. A beautiful picture of the loving, caring father. He defeated and he punished the Egyptians for what they had done. And then he says, I carried you on eagle's wings. Now, an eagle is a very powerful bird who has great strength. God is all powerful, has great strength. Eagles are very caring parents. They feed their young. They build these massive nests because they're massive birds that they keep the birds in. And then as the little eagles are learning, the eaglets, if you are trying to say it properly, right, Anissa, right? She's our grammar person over there. Yeah. When eagles are learning to fly, first learning to fly, if they start to fall, the mom or dad eagle will swoop down and pick them up and carry them. The eagles need that to survive until they can learn to fly themselves. To be carried means to rely upon someone else. God is the only one who can carry them to deliver them out of Egypt. He's the only one that can make that happen. He says he carried them to himself. Amen. God wanted the people to worship him, so he carried them just like an eagle does so that they could get to the place where they could do that. Now, God didn't just care for Israel, he cares for us too. 1 Peter chapter five says this, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. Anybody got any worries or cares? Okay, three of us, four, okay, quite a few, quite a few of us have some worries and cares. Give those to God because he cares for you. Amen. It's that simple, right? It sounds simple anyway. Is it simple? <laughs> it's simple up here, right? But when we actually have to play it out, it gets a little bit harder. Look at Philippians chapter four. It goes further. Don't worry about anything. Anybody worry about anything yet today? Sure you did. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Amen. God cares for us. And then Matthew chapter 11. Love this passage. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary. Anybody weary? Carry heavy burdens? I will give you rest. Amen. Take my yoke on you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Does anyone need to find rest for their souls? I can't read that without it just hitting me right here. It's like, wow, my soul so needs rest so often. And he tells us, that's where you're gonna get it. Come to me, set your worries aside. Instead of worrying about things, pray about things. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you. So God is our creator and he cares for us. But wait, there's more. Chapter, or verse five of Exodus 19. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. God delivered Israel from slavery. Okay, he did that because he cared for them. And Moses had consistently been telling Pharaoh before they got out of Egypt, he said, 
God says, let my people go so that they can worship me, right? The journey we've been talking about so far as we've gone through the book of Exodus has been about the deliverance. Now we're to the place where we're talking about worshiping and serving the God who delivered them, right? So it's a journey they began for deliverance, but now they're at a place at Sinai where they are gonna worship him. At Sinai, God was calling Israel to commit themselves to him in a covenant relationship. Only through obedience to him would they be a kingdom of priests, his holy nation. Now this was before the priesthood was actually instituted. That's coming in just a few chapters. But he said, you're gonna be a kingdom of priests for all the nations, for the whole world. God had a plan for Israel to make them that kingdom of priests. So God gets to make the rules because he has a plan for us. He created us, he cares for us, and he's got a plan for us. That's simple. That's why God gets to make the rules. And in case you're thinking, wait a minute, that was for Israel. He had a plan for Israel. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. That's Peter taking the imagery from the Old Testament and translating it to the New Testament for you and for me. He says, you are a chosen people, and I have a plan for you. Amen. We are God's possession. If you are a follower of Jesus, he has chosen you, and he has a plan, a purpose for your life. And that plan and purpose is to show others the goodness of God so that they will want to understand the goodness of God. Amen. Our testimony each and every one of us, whether you have a dramatic testimony where you were saved out of uh, a lot of sordid things or whether you trusted Christ when you were a little kid and got saved from being a vlogger one day and you, uh, either way, he saved you out of darkness into light. Finally, as we start wrapping up today, look at Israel's response. It says, and all the people responded together we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses told Israel, hey, God has a plan for you guys. He created you, he cares for you, and he's about to give you some commandments. Before he told them what the commandments were, they said, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. Can you imagine? More than two million people. It says that they all said it together. Two million people responding in unison, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. Right? Would, would, would that be amazing? All right, you know where we're going, don't you? We're gonna try. We got about 300 of you here, all right? So it's not two million, but I reckon it, it'll sound pretty cool for all of us to say this in unison. And you online, yes, you get to say it too, out loud, I don't care if there's other people in the room or if you're driving and people think you're crazy, that's all right. We're gonna say this together when I count to three. And you can read it right here on the screen, all right? One, two, three. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. All right, that's good practice, all right? So we're gonna try it one more time, all right? At least one more, depending on how you go, all right? Here you go, one, two, three. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. Oh, I reckon that's all right. That's all right. One more time, all right? And say it like you mean it, all right? One, two, three. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. Wow, wow. Pastor Deanna, make note, all these people just committed to do everything the Lord has commanded. We don't even need to do the series, the rest of the series now, right? Of course, we know that statement was on Israel's lips. And I would suggest that they were sincere. They really did mean it when they said it. But in the days to come, in months to come, in years to come, they found that they weren't quite able to do everything the Lord had commanded. So what does that mean for you and I? Well, we are not unlike Israel. We all just said that, and you said it because I told you to. You probably didn't even give it a whole lot of thought. But I would say this is most of our heart. We would say, yes, I'll do what God wants me to do. Sure, I recognize he created me, he cares for me, he's got a plan for me, and I will do what he wants. But we are fallen, broken people. 
and we struggle to live this out. That's why in our mission statement, it says that we're striving to be uh, uh, a loving community, seeking, serving, and sharing Jesus. That phrase, striving to be, is an acknowledgement that we're not going to always get it right because we are fallen, broken people. But we're trying, we're striving to be. And it shouldn't stop us from trying because we're going to fail. That's what the striving is all about. So question, who is influencing you? Who gets to make the rules that you live by? It's pretty simple to figure it out. Answer the question this way, who are you allowing to speak into your life? Who are you following, if you will? Wow, we could talk about social media for the next hour now, couldn't we? Who are you following? Who are you letting make the rules for your life? You may not have even realized it, but who you follow is important because they are influencing you. They are making the rules that you're going to live by. Let me suggest to you that today you've been given pretty clear evidence why God should be the one that gets to make the rules for your life. He gets to make the rules because he created us. He cares for us. And he has a plan for us. We have to decide how we're going to respond. Not to the rules, but to the God who makes them. Anybody love rules? I don't like rules. Yeah, be in the car with me when I'm driving. You'll know. I don't like rules. But you know what? The rules that God gives us, they come from him. And he created me. He cares for me. He has a plan for me. So whether I like rules or not, I love God because he loves me. So I'm going to respond to the person who makes the rules, not the rules. Because God is creator. We submit to him. We obey him. We worship him. We serve him. Because God cares for us We can trust him. It's so important. God wants us to rely on him, just like the young eagles need to rely on their parents. Think about this, because we're going to get into some commandments next week and following. But if we trust God and his provision, you know what we won't do? Steal. You heard thou shalt not steal? It comes back to trusting God. If we trust God for protection, that he's going to take care of us, you know what we won't need to do? Kill. Thou shalt not kill. You've heard that? It comes back to trusting God because he cares for us. He has our best interest in mind. And finally, because God has a plan for us, we can follow him. That's where we take action. That's where we take steps. We step up. We step out. We step into. We step into places and things that we may be afraid of and that we may have never thought possible. But because God said it, I will do it because it's his plan for me. rules to live by. As we go through this series, don't focus on the rules. Focus on who makes the rules. You can say it this way. Don't be a rule follower. Be a God follower. We're going to talk a lot about rules, and we're going to wrestle those to the ground about how they apply to us today and how we work those into our life and our society and everything. But at the end of the day, don't be a rule follower. Be a God follower. If that means you end up following some rules, then so be it. But start here by following God, not the rules. I'm excited about this series, you can probably tell, because God created us. God cares for us, and he's got a plan for us. And we're going to unpack and learn what that looks like as we look at the rules for us to live by. Father, thank you for your word Thank you for the book of Exodus and your relationship with the nation of Israel that brought us these rules to live by. And Lord, help us as we try to understand what they mean for our lives. Lord, we all said here today, whatever the Lord says, we will do. The Lord will go out of here today and probably do some things that aren't what you said because we're fallen, broken people. Thank you for your mercy. 
thank you for your grace. Lord, help us to lean into you as the one who owns us because you created us, the one who cares for us and provides and protects and meets all our needs, and the one who has a plan for us. Help us lean into that plan and to walk in your ways as we follow Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you.